Uh, I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, we have a number of participants that are joining online, including three speakers. But uh, with me, I have a speaker who is on site. Yeah, so we shall uh, be starting the session. And uh, if there's anyone else joining us, to to join us when we're ready on the session. So, um, just a brief session uh, details of the session. Uh, we are going to talk about connectivity at critical time, yeah, during and after crisis. I'm sure all of us have um, heard of uh, experiences where maybe the country has been hit by uh, maybe a disaster, a flood, or uh, maybe an earthquake. And uh, communication is a problem. Uh, humanitarian coordination is a problem. So. Um, we do acknowledge that providing uh, communications during disaster response uh, has been a great challenge for many communities and countries. Uh, these, cha uh, these challenges are linked with providing uh, this uh, communication, particularly, if, uh, for example, to humanitarian responders, yeah, relief agencies, and the affected communities uh, usually uh, don't have the chance to be able to First of all, get access about what has happened and uh, who is going to help and how. Yeah. So uh, just uh, from the United Nations Emergency Telecommunications Cluster of 2020 strategy, uh, it fostered uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration necessary to provide the logistics, training, and services to meet the communications demand in uh, uh, disconnected communities during and after crises. Uh, so access to a resilient, uh, we believe that access to a resilient, uh, robust, and secure telecommunications infrastructure during a crisis is critical because, of course, without the communication, it is difficult to coordinate one humanitarian response to the disaster. It is difficult to disseminate information in real time. Yeah. Uh, for the humanitarian responders and also the community that is affected. Uh, so this uh, connectivity is uh, also needed, of course. You know, we have uh, in such areas there are students who need to continue learning so that they don't get left behind. And uh, there are, of course, companies, people who, are, who want to continue doing their business as usual. So this session is inspired by examples of communication infrastructure deployments used in disaster response by various humanitarian and te uh, technical organizations. Some of these inspirations are the Hurricane Maria disaster in uh, 2017. Uh, there's the Beirut explosion on 4th August 2020. We all remember how um, the, 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 the fact that there was communication helped like the world to know what is happening and the world was able to support so easily like uh, uh, you saw how individuals were able to to donate up to individual level like from organization to individual level countries came up to to support and then uh, there's also the current 2022 russian invasion of ukraine yeah so um with me i have uh, speakers uh, i have kathan uh, i mean ethan sorry I have Ethan. So uh, we're just going to have uh, the speakers uh, uh, introduce themselves, their names and uh, uh, their organizations just uh, quickly and we can jump into uh, some of the key things we want to take from this session. Otherwise, I'd request that uh, people take the front seats with their mics so that uh, you can be able to say anything at any time. The session should really be interactive. So. I'll be calling upon everyone really to give their views in the course of the session. Otherwise, uh, Ethan, please, I think I can start with you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ethan Mudavan, who has been advertised. I am the ISOC IGF's global um, ambassador, and I'm also a tech public policy uh, lawyer at Access Partnership, which is a global public policy firm. All right, thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, do we have Caleb online? Or if Caleb is not online, Shah, I'm sure Shah is already online. 
So, Shai, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, this is uh, Sha. Uh, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, me loud and okay. clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Sha for the record. Yes, uh, I am uh, Sha Zaidurman participating this uh, uh, workshop uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, I am a tech strategist and also working in policy developments currently affiliated with the UI host, which is the uh, renowned hosting service and uh, data service provider in Bangladesh. I am also an executive committee member of Asia Pacific School of Internet Governance and I also some of the fellow of different organizations. Uh, I basically in, uh, hold uh, the technical community, so uh, this is about myself. Get back to you, Innocent. All right, thank you very much, Shah. Uh, we have Eileen. Eileen, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you. everyone. Uh, good morning, good uh, evening, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Eileen from, and I'm joining you from Kenya. Uh, I'm an engineer with with a passion for internet governance issues, um, particularly those inclined on gender, gender inclusion, digital uh, inclusion. Sorry about that. And today I'm glad to join you to discuss on uh, this particular session, and I hope it will be uh, a successful one. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, we have uh, lastly online, we have uh, Anestina. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Anestina, I'm your Cotteria. I'm joining today from Ghana, and I'm with a private sector, a telecom engineer in the private sector in a company in Ghana. And I'm also the chairperson for the ISOC Women and Youth Community Ghana chapter. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Anestina. On my right hand side, I have uh, Caleb, who has just joined us physically. So, Caleb, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you. My name is Caleb Kwabna Aite Kufe. I'm a member of Internet Society Ghana Chapter and also uh, a fellow of Ghana School of Internet 2020. Uh, I'm here to also speak on the topic. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, thank you all speakers for, for that round of introduction. And... Um, we have uh, a number of questions, but of course these questions are just going to round the, the, the discussion, the topic, and we're going to try and break it down to some of the parameters that we've listed. Uh, so to, to Ethan here, Ethan, uh, we have already acknowledged that the need for connectivity during and, and after crisis times is uh, paramount, yeah, but uh, there's a question, who ensures that the internet works during a disaster or a crisis? Who is responsible? Thank you for that. Um, I'm glad I, I start with the easy question because I believe the answer there is similar to the question of who, who does the internet belong to, right? So we all have a part to play when it comes to preparedness for the crisis um, or, or that that is post or before before the crisis and that is after the crisis as well so we all have a part to play in this be it if you're in civil society um, maybe your critical role there might be providing clear strategies around how to minimize damaging to to the critical infrastructure that will be present I know some of my colleagues here will talk more on critical infrastructure but um, there's a role for civil society they are closest to to users, I believe, and so um, there are issues around benchmarking the best practices uh, ex against experienced jurisdictions that they could assist around um, that is considering the high risks involved in the various jurisdictions, um, that is defining the role of public institutions, the telecommunication operators, and also other stakeholders um, around your national emergency telecommunication plans, um, and 
integrating those national emergency telecommunication plans um, as a climate change and climate adoption policy uh, priority. So civil society as a role is effectively is what I'm saying, but it doesn't stop there. Um, your government also has a role in this, uh, that is including or regulating for future technologies to assist when it comes to uh, preparedness, when it comes to resilience of the connection and the internet. Um, and we can do that by envisioning satellite IoT uh, as part of emergency systems by enabling M to M uh, solutions as search and rescue alternatives, and also prioritizing uh, user-centered and widely accessible solutions. So government has a role to play, but there must be forward thinking in, in all of this. And I, say, I suppose lastly, I can go into um, the, the, I'll probably say it because I'm a little bit biased coming from the private sector, but probably the most important is the partnerships that exist, um, be it government and private, be it, you know, government and private and civil society, but all of us joining forces to, to, to create a better solution or at least better resilience for our, our connections. So um, we, there's a need for partnerships around delivering activation protocols uh, known to the industry because sometimes we have government saying things or, or trying to implement certain um, issues or certain, certain solutions, policies, um, but they're not industry known best practices. So there's a, a uh, incoherence when it comes to the conversation itself. Um, so that's also including empowering or promoting national and international uh, coordination and collaboration along those lines. And um, if I can just end by this, I would, I would like to give just practical examples of um, issues or at least case studies where we've actually seen um, partnerships between private and uh, private private-public partnerships along these areas and um, it has actually worked to, to, to a large extent in mitigating some of the damages um, and um, ensuring that or at least some uh, there's a level of connectivity uh, remaining and one example was in Australia where they had the stand program and you can all look uh, further into this um, and at your own time, but the STAN program, uh, it was a disaster satellite service, and that was the first ser service to be rolled out um, through funding provided by the government, um, and it was strengthening telecommunications against natural disasters, as you mentioned. It's, it's one of the, the crisis points that we face. Um, and in China, they had the ba ba Badu, sorry for my uh, pronunciation, but the Badu satellite system, and that also an integrated satellite services. So it's we're constantly seeing issues of terrestrial and extraterrestrial combinations, right? So far, especially here in Africa, we see examples of us trying to ensure our infrastructures just at a terrestrial level are are at a good base, but I think going forward, um, there's a need for combined efforts around terrestrial and extraterrestrial um, coverage. And we've been seeing all of these examples. I can go on and on, but I'll allow the time for the rest of, of, of the talk. All right. Thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, you've really broken it down. Uh, who ensures that people are connected in case there's been a disaster? Yeah, uh, we are so glad to have uh, to have a multi-stakeholder model in this community. Yeah, it gives responsibility in the hands of everyone, whether the person is in government, academia, civil society, uh, private sector. So at the end of the day, it's it's what makes us um, stronger. It's what's making the internet stronger and growing uh, even bigger. Yeah. We all know that the internet has become a lifeline. So at the end of the day, um, some of these issues, uh, like um, the upcomings, there's a disaster. Uh, those are the challenges that we need to deal with. Uh, we have um, a number of people in the room here. I'm sure they have different perspectives on how these strategies can be laid forward. But of course, as we go ahead, I'm sure you're going to have a number of questions, a number of um, addition the speakers are saying so please feel free to raise up your hand in the room or uh, in case there's uh, any participant online uh, uh, please will not be uh, be sure to ping me uh, so that uh, we can have uh, the, the opportunity for that participant so um, with me I have Caleb but um, allow me go to the next speaker uh, who is online
just uh, Caleb came in a bit late, so I just won't give him time. Um, so, Sha, uh, over to you. Uh, I'm very sure you're, you're listening. Um, I'd like us to talk about resources. What resources are needed to deploy and maintain communication infrastructure during and after crisis? Over to you, Sha. This is uh, Sha again. Uh, this is actually this is a good question. Actually, uh, I will try to uh, cover my answer from my experience. Uh, as I told you earlier, that I had a work experience on that uh, long time on that uh, telco operations, telco and ICT operations. So I think uh, I can connect uh, this uh, question with the humanitarian aspect as well. So uh, there is uh, two parts of questions you ask. One is about uh, what resources during uh, need to be mobilized. This is and another part is uh, I understood that uh, after the crisis. So before I go to that, uh, 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 give that mobilization uh, answers, uh, I need to some points uh, that uh, make understood that uh, audience, uh, what are the uh, connectivity we need to think because a mobilization is uh, based uh, depends uh, mostly on the uh, analyze of the uh, uh, prices uh, that we are facing so uh, we need to assess uh, the situations in the first uh, keynote speaks you have mentioned different sorts of like uh, tsunami or uh, any sorts of natural disaster scheme so we need to focus on what are that uh, connectivity we may concentrate on that. Maybe uh, we can uh, uh, connectivity can think of that national and local authorities because they are the authorities, uh, those who perform the uh, role during the national disasters, like uh, any countries, uh, uh, there is a NDMA, National Disaster Resource Management Organizations. This management office included with that uh, ICTs, uh, ISPs, and uh, humanitarian organizations and the civil societies. So we have to also think of uh, that portions, uh, and also we have to evaluate that connectivity relevant to the affected population, which of the areas is affected due to the disasters. This is also the concentrating point for us, like uh, internet connectivity solutions affected that populations, uh, then we need maybe to design that deploy depending on each specific context, maybe considering the different needs like, like human and uh, socio-cultural economic and also the uh, affordability, digital literacy. These are the infrastructure that we also need to be under the considerations. One of the main other is things is like internet connectivity solutions, what we are provide. Uh, we understood that our context of the discussion is connectivity. So connectivity is uh, uh, now the uh, thing basics is uh, internet and it's also included with the voice, SMS and other data service. This is we understood that the basic things. So in terms of that service provided, we need to deploy different sorts of VSAT or uh, some sorts of Wi-Fi accessories through the um, uh, local partners or if we uh, have any others uh, stockholders uh, from the international perspective, they may help us in our deployment process. We need to ensure that service is restored uh, with the help of all the stockholders. Then I uh, come to that now point to uh, uh, what could be mobilized. As I told in this uh, perspective, in a uh, general uh, cons uh, consequence, uh, we need to deploy, uh, uh, first of all, in that uh, technical perspective, those who have the expertise, uh, the basic expertise on the uh, 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 routing, switching, and all that uh, we said, because during the natural disasters, there might be affected the uh, national ISP. So uh, the emergency basis, we need to restore the service using that VSAT or the satellite connections. And also uh, we need to make a hub. Uh, so wherever the disaster happens. Uh, so to make this hub, we maybe need some sorts of uh, technicians, those who are also uh, uh, relevant to that power because here one of the importance in these discussions like uh, 
uh, when the disasters occurs, uh, the power is most one of the important. So we need to think of that uh, uh, solar powers and uh, unless we have any battery because the battery backup on that times. And also we need to have a, a good uh, 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 portable uh, service uh, that uh, may have uh, a generators uh, indicate in this uh, uh, humanitarian countries where the natural disasters occurs. Basically, uh, in a conventional way, when an ISP set up the network or the telecom operators uh, 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 with that, uh, uh, different uh, services uh, that uh, uh, comes in a package, but uh, during the crisis moment, we mostly focus on uh, the basic needs uh, first to deploy that infrastructures and to ensure a, uh, a minimum um, of quality of service so that we can ensure that everyone is connected, those who are unconnected, make sure that that connected. Here I need to improve, uh, uh, share that um, whenever the connections uh, we can ensure in the disasters area, then there is a provision to uh, ISPs or the mobile operators uh, uh, affected. We have to be then uh, take their, we have to give them also the supports uh, or uh, uh, whatever uh, we can uh, make a, a good uh, partnership then uh, time to time we have to restore all uh, the services. Uh, basically, uh, the mobilization process, it uh, depends on uh, uh, what are the service we are going to giving these times. Uh, uh, most importantly, the uh, portable connections and uh, minimum uh, data space and also ensure the privacy and uh, also uh, uh, the concerns of uh, protections of data service. These are the uh, things to mobilize. So empowering the peoples on that time is very important. Not only the technical perspective, but also we have also minimum uh, the uh, knowledge of that ICT. We have to take bring on that uh, 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 this uh, uh, task and also we need to take that government support as well so these sorts of things are need to be uh, 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 mobilization during the crisis and after that crisis whenever we have mixed uh, nature uh, like that emergency service we have restored it then we have the responsibility to operate this service for a certain period because due to the natural disasters maybe the isp or or the uh, telecom service provider they have affected but after that crisis when we are giving this service that is called the operational procedure uh, this temporary service need to give that a certain level and then we have to think of like for example i said that uh, during that time i have a need of that uh, uh, grid or we can have a uh, multiple generator or uh, then we can uh, set up a battery backup. So these are the things, technical as in uh, process level. So we have to be uh, make a service level uh, assurance that we can make up to the mark service. And then we can operate all these service uh, to deliver for the national peoples. And then we can uh, think whenever the uh, disasters, uh, maybe the government or the uh, locals, ISP uh, service provider, uh, ICTs provider, they have a restored. So time to time, we have to keep them aligned what, uh, how we can then, uh, because this is not that permanent solution. Maybe. maybe we can have a community network to support on that times. So these are the follow-up processes after the crisis. We need to be uh, ensured with other stakeholders, including the government and the service uh, providers, so that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, deliver a smooth service uh, after the crisis as well. And uh, uh, we can make sure uh, that uh, the all humanitarian needs uh, meted during and after the crisis. Uh, this is actually from my experience uh, that I'm sharing how uh, an infrastructure need to be deployed during the crisis and how we can uh, optimize our service with a, a, a maximum uh, satisfaction level. Uh, that is from my side. Uh, uh, I think uh, I will 
Any more or questions? I back to you, Vincent. All right. Thank you very much, Shah. Uh, that has really been very comprehensive. Um, I have Shah here. Uh, uh, I mean, I have uh, Caleb, but Shah has talked about um, resources that are needed, and uh, he has talked about uh, technical resources. Uh, I'd love uh, Caleb on my right hand side here to give us uh, an idea of what exactly critical infrastructure would um, would mean. For example, we have a crisis. How would you describe critical infrastructure at such a time? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Once again, my name is Caleb. Uh, critical infrastructure can be considered as a system, an asset, whether physical or virtual, in our digital world. In terms of crisis, we must understand that we must understand the three elements of critical infrastructure which is the physical, the cyber, and the human. We must also understand the uh, effectiveness of the critical infrastructure for ensuring the effective functioning of the economy, as it is an essential factor in our determining the location of the economy activity and the kinds of activities or sectors that can develop within a country. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, as he was talking about critical infrastructure in this perspective, something came up um, in my mind, and that is, um, I read about something, uh, a topic uh, called, and in it they were talking about the need for countries to start laying strategies uh, through which they can be able to protect their critical infrastructures. Yeah, for example, um, uh, main, uh, the main critical infrastructures most countries have right now. You talk about power grids, you talk about hydroelectric dams. Yeah, so many countries um, are having a challenge of protecting these infrastructure, uh, especially from uh, in case uh, in uh, in case they are being controlled. Uh, automatically or uh, computer yeah so um, there have uh, there have been scenarios of uh, for example uh, a power grid is hacked and someone can actually switch off an entire side of the city if they have access to that uh, to that infrastructure so at the end of the day um, as we're talking about uh, the critical infrastructure would need for a crisis yeah, something that can be fast. Like it's not like we are going to have to think so far, but things that are very paramount that uh, we can pick up so fast and uh, and uh, be able to get back communication systems uh, or uh, uh, support uh, communication in such a region. Uh, I would also request us to think about how we can protect this critical infrastructure. Yeah. That is something that is very key that countries uh, and communities need to look into. I'll give you a scenario of, um, for example, you have a hydroelectric dam. Yeah. Uh, what if someone is able to access the systems and they are able to release any volume of water that they want at any particular time? Yeah. Some of these things we need to start thinking at, uh, about them uh, this early because um, I usually believe that. The future is going to be more of, um, I'm not predicting the future, but I'm just trying to say, uh, the, uh, according to the series of events, we all know that disaster is going to be a part of us, yeah, due to climate change and all that. Floods, uh, earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, and, and all those, yeah. But uh, we, we as a community uh, that understands what needs to be done, we know what can be done. Actually, um, for example, we're talking about critical infrastructure during times of crisis. What if we plan that um, because we can have this, we know regions where uh, they face challenges of disasters. Some of those regions, we have data about them. Yeah, Some countries are even good, uh, lucky enough to have systems that can detect disaster before it happens. Yeah, 
what about we plan earlier what about we set up strategies that can be able to mitigate some of these damages after the the disaster so um i have another speaker uh, that i would love to to ask a question particularly uh, that's a so Aileen, um our Shah talked about resources he talked about who needs to be on board talked about stakeholders so Aileen, how do how do we ensure that all stakeholders actually work together because Aileen has a background of working with the stakeholders and um, uh, especially on issues of uh, resourcing so uh, Aileen, how do we ensure that uh, stakeholders that uh, Ethan mentioned here are able to work together and solicit resources yeah and of course uh, how do we ensure that uh, there's uh, capacity building for stakeholders yeah to plan and respond to disasters using ICTs Aileen so much uh, can you hear me yes loud and clear thank you okay um we have to understand that disasters can strike in and uh, COVID-19 has actually proven to us that emergencies can happen anywhere at any time. Affordative measures by working together to provide emergency equipment. When COVID-19 hit, um, the whole world was taken uh, at, to a standstill for some time because everyone was confused. Nobody expected uh, such a situation to happen because it was unprecedented so um i found that there was uh, a lot of confusion and people didn't know what to do uh, companies had to uh had to close some of them had to close and if some of them had to take their employees to work from home and you know for people to work from home they need uh, resources like laptops and internet connectivities and this was uh for instance, I would use an example of the company that I was working with at that time. Uh, we were many, and we could actually we could not uh, work in the offices because of social distancing. So you know, we had to go work from home, and we needed uh, machines to work and also internet connectivity. So my company um, decided to partner with the companies that were providing. Uh, the laptops and also the internet service providers that could provide providers with the internet and in this partnership uh, i can take it as a practical example of how stakeholders in this case my company and those other companies came together to to provide us they overlook they overlook their, their they, they they rose before their above their business interest for the common good of us to be able to work so uh, i would say this um uh, with the practical of stakeholders can actually come together to solicit resources in order to enable continuity because uh, of course uh, the normal daily process has, has to continue and people have to continue their lives and you find that also when um, uh, schools had to continue running and this one needed the uh, government to come in to come in and um, provide uh, work together with organizations to solicit uh, resources like the laptops for the children to work with and also provide internet connectivity in schools in order to continue learning. Um, I would also say that ITU as a UN agency, it plays a critical role of ICT in disaster risk reduction and, managing, and management by supporting its member states in the phases of disaster management. And it does this through design of uh, a national emergency telecommunication plan whereby it actually has a, a strategic plan that by 2023 all countries should have a national emergency telecommunication plan as part of their national and and according to uh, a baseline assessment that they conducted they found that 29 percent of countries are the ones that actually have uh, this plan in place and you find that there, and the, you find that the low-income countries are left out. And when we, according to studies, we see that countries that are prone to disasters are these countries that come from um, low-income areas. 
and they are the ones that are missing this uh teleco plan so it it beats the logic because if you really want to uh, build resilience in uh, managing a disaster and you don't have the plan it will be uh, at all order for you to be able to manage this so it is uh, important for the government and uh, local stakeholders to come together and ensure that we develop a we develop a, an emergency telecommunication plan for every country so that when a disaster strike we don't have to uh, seek help from far instead we can be able to help ourselves from within we don't have to go far away to seek that assistance when we have the plan in place and uh, civil society can also come in place by creating adv advocacy that is this is now the capacity building aspect we have to uh, train uh, communities when a disaster strike what what is expected of them so when you when you when you train a community on uh, what is expected they become aware and uh, they are able to actually when when now a real disaster strike they are able to to navigate around and be able to see how to how to prove how to build resilience on this and also prevent future occurrences of a disaster so for government it is a um, a disaster management should be a question of policy working together with internet service providers to develop systems that can detect and uh, prevent and even shield these communities from downturns of a disaster it is, is a central um, thing to keeping the internet working around the clock and also the stakeholders as uh, uh, when they come together they are able to source for funding uh we are promoting the spirit of multi-stakeholderism and uh, of course, when a disaster strike, we will need uh, finance. Finance is a, an as, is a critical aspect of uh, of managing a disaster, and it is definitely needed. So when when the stakeholders come together to provide these finances, you find it will make it easy to manage this disaster when it strikes. And also, in future, they will be able to they will be able to uh, mitigate it. Yeah, I think that's uh, what I can say about uh, stakeholders coming together to soliciting resources, um, actually building capacity building to communities. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Eileen. Um, Eileen has talked about the community, yeah, the affected community. That's a very strong stakeholder that we should be looking at here, yeah. Um, how we can be able to help these communities um, recover or uh, prepare uh, on how to mitigate some of the the, the effects of uh, a disaster. So um, we have a question. Uh, we have a question online, but just before I go to that question, uh, I have uh, I have another speaker, uh, Anestina, and Anestina. Uh, basing or um, following what Eileen has just talked about especially for the community yeah which uh, that is a strong stakeholder that we should be looking at here uh, how can um, these communities or uh, the organizations in such an area prepare to mitigate the the negative effects of a disaster or a crisis yeah on um, the the negative effects especially on the critical tele uh, technology infrastructures yeah okay thank you very much um so for first and foremost we need to know the importance of technology infrastructures of which the telecom sector is part we need to know the importance of such during crisis then we can move on to what negative effects it will have on the people on the community and then the nation as a whole and how we can mitigate it so we need to note that um during crisis the telecom sector helps to make people stay safe connected and informed these are the three basic things the telecom sector does in terms of communication and then it does this by notifying people of your occurring disasters where disasters are being hit and so people should not go there measures to help them keep safe and that's this helps to save lives so this is the basic thing that the telecom 
sector does during crisis. And so if we have no connectivity, if the telecom sector goes down, then it means that we're going to lose so many lives because people will not be informed, people will not know which side to pass or where to hide in terms of crisis, um, how to communicate for help, etc. Now, the first thing I'll talk about is backup, because in times of preparedness for anything at all in life, we know that there's supposed to be a backup. So how do we have backups for essential infrastructure? So when there's no form of communication, resiliency is not 100% in disasters. Like I said, their lives will be lost. And then there's no form of communication that would be passed around during disasters. And we need to have multiple communication options ready. We wouldn't need to depend on solely the telecom uh, mass standing in respective communities to provide services to the people in the community. Why? Because in disasters, we don't know what happened to each other. And so there has to be backups. We need to get backup batteries that would last long. We need to get generators that power up. Should there be a power outage that has made a telecom um, infrastructure fail to give connectivity to people in a certain space or area. So since they rely on power, the, um, sorry, since they rely on power, we wouldn't need to really um, rely solely on organizations that provide connectivity. But as the community, what can we also do for ourselves to help ourselves in times like this? We would also definitely need to have battery backups and anything to give us power. Power is the sole main thing in terms of connectivity because without power, we cannot bring up the telecom side. Without power, your phone itself cannot even work. There could be the mast standing there providing services, but because your phone is off, you're unable to connect to the internet. You're unable to make calls. So to prepare for this, we should consider backup power options. For example, battery packs for mobile devices, and um generators on standby for the telecom sites as well as homes all these things can be done when we have uh, community networks having people getting deployed into the communities to assist with all these things gathering people together in one place so that uh, we can provide them with the services rendered by telecommunication sectors in times of disaster now boosting portable telecom communication capabilities would help very much in times like this where we have vans that carry communication services to like by gathering the people around you can have a van there that provides communication services that has infrastructure like probably um satellites communicating to one particular hub and then being shared to community members in a particular confined zone where they can have access to the internet get the opportunity to communicate for help for food anything to save their lives. Um, also, we need to educate our communities, educate our citizens as well. In times of communication, everybody would want to reach out. Everybody would want to help. People would want to know what is going on elsewhere. But then we also know that when everybody is trying to use a particular service or infrastructure, it gets overloaded. So in times of disaster, we would need to educate our, sister, our citizens, sorry, our citizens and communities that in times of disaster, we put first things first. You would not need to try and watch a video of what is happening elsewhere. When someone else needs that particular resource to call out for help. So first things first, if it's not going to be you calling for help, you making a call because there's an urgency of food or you need an actual emergency then we need to educate ourselves that in times like this we should put hold or we should put on hold the things that matter to us in a normal lifestyle because we are not in normal times so if you want emergency access then you can use your phone if you want the urgency of maybe health care food letting people know that you need help somewhere then that is when we can actually use our phones to prevent overload in times like this and so i'll come back to the fact that the championing of um 
the championing of network communities or community networks would assist with all these things because we would need representatives. We would need people to get deployed to organize those that have been affected by disasters. We would need them to assist them, to help them in times of disasters, know how to communicate and which points to get to, to get connectivity. So I think the basic thing here, aside getting um, backups for power support, networks and the deployment of volunteers would also go a long way to help mitigate such crises or in times of crisis. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you to Anestina for that submission. Uh, online we have Shadrach. Shadrach has a submission on uh, what has been discussed in the house so far. So I'll uh, offer the mic to Shadrach just before I go to some of the questions that have been asked online. Yeah. And also, if we have any questions in the room or any submissions, please, uh, you can let me know. Thank you. Over to you, Shadrach. Uh, to the tech guys, would you please allow Shadrach to, to speak? Hello? Yes, Shadrach. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Innocent, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, yeah, so to add up to the discussion uh, so far, Mention a few stuff. Okay, smaller so infrastructure that we need to help the communities who are affected and then the emergency responders. Okay, so um, first of all, when we talk about this disaster, first we have to know um, the demands of the community. So we have to first assess whether the um, demand of the community is greater than uh, and the support that the community or the government can uh, uh, offer. That is when we'll be able to know that, okay, this uh, uh, incident um, actually is beyond the community or the government uh, 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 support. So then, then we have to call upon other international organizations and other actors. So in this case, if there is a disaster which um, the country cannot uh, afford to uh, 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 hold that um, disaster, that means it, the government now calls upon international organizations like the United Nations uh, World Food Program, the um, ETC cluster, where you have an uh, NGOs like uh, Net Network, you have uh, organizations like um, Cisco, who are also coming together to provide support. Okay, so back to the infrastructure here. When the disaster happens, first um, we have to assess the disaster. Um, do a survey and know the needs of the uh, uh, community. So is the community a mountainous community? Is it uh, 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 a, a flat community? So uh, is it uh, like a forest-based community? So all these have to be considered. Then you know that, okay, if um, the community is a mountainous community or a valley, you have to know that, okay, if it's a, com a mountainous community, then what are the resources? Are you going to use Vsat, are you going to use a uh, radios like uh, ubiquity uh, uh, um, power beam, light beam? Are you going to use access points? All these um, uh, um, uh, uh, resources have to be uh, considered. So if it's maintenance community, so um, what's your um, uh, backhaul? Where are you going to get connectivity from community which is affected? So now you consider first what is the need. First, are you going to use um, such phones, that satellite phones? To be able to provide some form of communication to uh, uh, maybe the head office, so that they'll be able to provide these resources. So first, the uh, um, emergency responder first would probably use a search for which can quickly um, communicate with the head office, so that with that they can provide some resources which can quickly um, uh, provide some means of communication. So here, uh, the communities can rely on um, began where. 
need any infrastructure, they just set up and then provide some uh, uh, Wi-Fi access point to a few people. Then when connectivity is established, then the community can now uh, 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 rely on other infrastructure which are a bit de uh, delayable. So for example, if the community wants to rely on VSAT, then they can have uh, uh, VSAT connected with uh, uh, um, radios. For example, as I said, um, the uh, uh, ubiquity uh, devices which are on lenses. So with that one, they can quickly So when this is um, set up, they can now uh, relay connectivity to the community for them to have access to um, the internet. And this also calls for uh, power. To have a uh, connectivity, the community also have to have power. And in this case, there are other means of uh, power access. That's a sustainable energy means. So using, uh, for example, uh, solar panels, the community can quickly have access to um, power where maybe the, the, the national grid is destroyed, they can rely on solar panels to power their phones and then connect to the infrastructure. So these are some of the resources that the community have to have. But first doing the assessment of the disaster and then knowing which devices are going to be needed. And here, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll put an example of uh, the resource that uh, NetHope um, Uses. So for them, they basically most of the time use uh, uh, Cisco Miraki devices where uh, they have the MR device, the uh, security appliance, they have the uh, Cisco Miraki um, access points and the switches. So without those devices, they can quickly deploy a uh, 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 hastily formed networks which are quickly uh, um, hastily formed. So without the community can quickly um, uh, get access to the network without uh, having to um, delay much on uh, some of uh, the uh, licensing and other uh, policies that um, the, the, the government may put in place in a particular country. And also to touch on um, other issues like um, the stakeholders um, who needs to come together to uh, uh, provide the resource. Here we have the government, we have the private sector, civil society, and other stakeholders. So what is the government uh, part when it comes to uh, uh, emergencies? Here, the government can provide uh, uh, um, some um, um, spectrum to provide co connectivity. The government can also provide other resources like computers, the routers, and other to provide connectivity. Whilst the technical community can also help to train people to set up this um, infrastructure, example is the community networks. Okay, uh, um, academia and civil society can also be doing some education regarding all these uh, infrastructure. So uh, basically, this is the little one that I will be adding to when it comes to emergency telecommunication. So it's very important all stakeholders come together, bring their resources. Then communities who are affected by disasters can have access to the internet, and then we all can benefit from the internet thank you all right thank you very much shadrach uh that has been shadrach ankra from ghana shadrach is the lead brain behind this session uh that's why he had uh, ample time to be able to give his submission uh, so um online we have uh, elna elna has a perspective here he says uh what he has personally experienced is uh, the case that uh, actually the government cuts the connectivity by shutting down the internet in times of some crisis in order to prevent disinformation. Can it be justified? And then uh, he goes ahead to say, um, let me just, uh, he goes ahead just how and we develop strategies without involving the government which can sometimes be on the side of disrupting connectivity instead of ensuring open internet okay Elna, uh, one thing is that uh, you cannot have a crisis in a country and uh, work without the government that is one thing i think everyone might uh, can agree with um, because the government at this point will def definitely be um, strategic stakeholder or the lead stakeholder even if the humanitarian agencies or um, uh, 
support pro uh, kind of relief aid to the ones who have been affected the government always has to take lead like uh, through the 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 office that is responsible for disaster preparedness and of course the the ministries uh, that are responsible for such infrastructure that has been developed uh, i mean that has been destroyed and then also the private sector companies that could be owning that infrastructure so yes i agree that um, sometimes the internet is uh, either censored or uh, shut down to make uh, uh to 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 stop disinformation but at this point how do we describe the disinformation uh, is also something we all need to look at yeah when there's a disaster what do we want the world to know about the disaster do we want something uh, to be hidden yeah so at the end of the day that is the politics that uh, comes in during such kind of response uh, during such kind of um, uh, response uh, uh, towards uh, these disasters but otherwise speaker so uh, I have Ethan here I'm sure he has a perspective on that uh, Ethan if you can say anything on that uh, trying to justify whether it's uh, acceptable or not for the government to shut down the internet because it feels like uh, maybe sometimes it doesn't want some information to go out there or it doesn't want the actual numbers we saw this during covid yeah where some governments were intentionally um trying to regulate the information that goes out there what the world knows about the reality of covid and to you ethan um thank you for for the question I think um, just to answer it in sort of like a part A and part B, so part A, uh, which was actually part B of your question, is uh, whether we can do without the government. And I think on to your point, um, the government is an implementing body. So whatever policy or whatever strategy solution that we may come up or uh, come up with, um, at the end of the day, we need them to implement the ideas. Um, so. It's, it's probably the spirit of this, this platform and this conference, but it's when we're talking about multi-stakeholder approaches, um, we're saying that these conversations are not easy to have because we're all speaking different languages um, and have different processes to, to adhere to, um, but we must still have those conversations. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the basis of, um, of well, the internet, but also moving forward and ensuring a resilient internet connection um, during crises. Um, and then the other part, which is around, can it ever be justified? Um, I'll, my, my political answer would be that should be a case-by-case -case sort of analysis. Um, sometimes there's less coverage that is produced um, or directed towards certain areas because, for example, if it's a natural disaster, that we need the resources to be um, channeled towards a particular area where there are victims or potential victims in those areas. Um, so the situations vary, um, but in a general, I could say that um, we, 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 we need to have an approach where we, we support an open internet, um, and uh, that would be my, my, my general answer to that. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ethan. Uh, so we still have another question. Thank you very much for that submission. Uh, unless another speaker has a different perspective or something they'd love to add to that. Uh, we have a question um, from, um, just speak out. Okay, uh, from Wilma. Wilma asks what the IGF is doing about internet connectivity and accessibility for persons with disability okay uh in this context we do agree that uh whenever there's a crisis there are always uh, uh persons that are more vulnerable for example the pwds we saw this during uh, uh the covid pandemic where most of the pwds were complaining about access to information because uh, sometimes the information was there but it wasn't in their format like uh, if i can't hear and uh, you are broadcasting the information using uh, sound then i won't be able to hear but uh, of course we also saw stakeholders trying to uh, to bridge up the gap 
yeah by trying to see that uh, there was a solution to to every aspect of the communication yeah from the pictorials to the to the sound and all that so here at IGF uh, how how stakeholders are working to see that uh, persons with disabilities are considered we all know that uh, right from the proposals of these sessions uh, there's an aspect of inclusion yeah of inclusion uh, where you have to real uh, show that uh, the session is uh, inclusive if possible you should be having um, uh, person dis with disability represented. I'll give you an example of, um, okay, I coordinate the youth IGF in Uganda. Uh, this year's youth IGF in Uganda, we had a number of uh, young people living with disability. We actually gave them their own session to talk about accessibility in their perspective, yeah, to share their experiences with the audiences, just so that uh, people can understand that um, during crisis or during disaster, uh, they are usually the most affected because even during the normal times, they are still facing challenges. Yeah, I hope uh, that gives some light on uh, that question. Uh, unless there's a speaker who wants to add something or uh, anyone in the room that has an additional comment or, uh, yeah. So, um, I have another question for Ethan. Sorry, Ethan, I'm so much on your back, but <laughs> I think this this will be... Oh, uh, okay, Ethan, I guess you're lucky. Uh, we have a question or submission there. Thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chair. Uh, just a comment. Uh, my name is Talan Sultanov from Internet Society Kyrgyzstan chapter. I wanted to follow up on the point that you raised earlier, detecting disasters early. And uh, I wanted to share one experience that we are doing in Kyrgyzstan in cooperation with uh, uh, Inst Center for Theoretical Physics in under UNESCO. Uh, it's uh, using IoT devices and LoRaWAN uh, uh, communication technology to uh, try to monitor uh, climate change and to prevent disasters. And uh, this is going to be a really interesting project. We received uh, support from ISOC Foundation. Uh, UT uh, devices and uh, uh, one of the speakers earlier mentioned that the uh, power supply is, is key to these kinds of uh, projects and these IoT devices will be using very little energy so they can last for long and we're going to use them in mountainous areas of Kyrgyzstan as a pilot project and we hope to then maybe perhaps next at the next IGF we can report uh, on the progress uh, the climate change in the past two years has become very evident in Kyrgyzstan, so we are having uh, avalanches, floods, uh, everything, uh, and uh, heavy rains in places where there was never rain. And now we are trying to uh, use the technologies to uh, kind of monitor and hopefully prevent some of these uh, disasters. And to uh, communicate uh, the information from these IoT devices, we will be using this very low bandwidth uh, um, frequencies, uh, LoRa one, uh, and um, there is one challenge that we are facing, and I think it will be interesting experience. Uh, we are plan to use uh, license-free uh, spectrum. However, in uh, some of the countries, like in Kyrgyzstan, even license-free spectrum is not readily available. So we will be trying to how to see how governments are open or flexible uh, in providing spectrum access to these kinds of uh, projects. Uh, so, um, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, in the future, uh, share more information and if there are colleagues who would like to learn more, we, we will be available. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that submission. Uh, yeah, detecting uh, disaster before it happens is actually something we are looking at so much in this session. It's something that every stakeholder here should be taking back home. Yeah. And um, if possible, we should be able to influence the, the responsible or uh, the respective um, uh, agencies to be able to put this in mind. Yesterday, I was talking to, um, uh, to an officer uh, from Uganda, from, from my country, and I was telling him about uh, uh, the need for them to plan. Yeah? Uh, sometimes it's not about waiting for something to happen, 
but you actually have an added advantage if you know that something is going to happen. There are some countries that are having access, for example, to satellite data and all that. So, meaning usually they are able to detect what is coming and the magnitude. Yeah. So, what about we use such data to be able to plan? Yeah. You have plan on ground or going to happen, but this is what we can do. Uh, and usually, uh, you'll find that uh, when you have that plan. The, the impact might be serious, but then you might already be able to mitigate it or uh, you might be already uh, ready to catch up like within the shortest time uh, possible. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I have a question about, oh, please, we have a submission. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. My name is Ndinala Itumba and I'm a researcher and master student from the University of Cape Town. Uh, my question is, I think the speakers have shared a lot about uh, the sustainability issues of community wireless networks, uh, mainly power issues and um, other things like setting up these networks and helping the communities. So my question is, what are your ideas or opinions on building um, community network resilience? And like, how can communities stand alone and uh, be strong through sustaining these community networks, um, especially when it comes to network management? Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that question. Uh, Ethan, I was actually going to ask you about community networks. So I think that is basically the question for you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, before I get to that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address that. But I just wanted to highlight something that I think is very important um, for all of us as we go back to our various communities. Um, and that's one point that Caleb was talking about around uh, critical infrastructure. And I think one of the challenges we face is that we don't even have a shared definition of what criti critical inf infrastructure is. So moving on from that and then the resilience part of it, and if we're talking about community networks parts, um, it becomes difficult when we can't have a harmonized um, uh, framework around this. Um, and uh, just last month at the plenitentiary uh, for, at the ITU, there was one resolution around cybersecurity and there are several issues um, on, on it, but one of the more contentious issues was really that member states couldn't agree on what critical infrastructure was. Um, so these are the challenges that we're facing and as like I
reduced um, in response time. Uh, this is the, the healthcare sector. For every minute that they reduced um, in, in their procedures, they decreased um, their overall mortality by 17%. That's just by reducing your one-minute response time. Um, for for every 10% reduction in response time in the UK, they are 7% in mortality rates. Um, and uh, for this is around property damage. If we're talking infrastructure as well, um, for every minute reduced uh, when it comes to response times for fires in New Zealand and in the United States, around 2,700 to 6,000. US dollars uh, reduced in infrastructure damaged costs. So we're just talking about one minute, reducing our response time in one minute. And then to break that down into what that means for the conversations that we are having right now is um, how can we reduce the response time in during disasters uh, to assist our communities uh, to alleviate some of these issues? Well, one of the issues was 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 already shared. Um, could be our licensing. How can we licensing frameworks that are geared towards emergency communications? Um, how can we pre better prepare? Right. So preparedness in facilitating emergency response capabilities and planning in and factoring in, um, including the availability and access to uh, all the necessary satellite equipment um, and training personnel to install you so sounding like a broken record here but I, I strongly believe in the uh, combination between terrestrial and extraterrestrial um, work and and um, collaboration when it comes to connectivity in these issues um, and it's also guaranteeing flexibility when it comes to measures to facilitate emergency communications deployment and um, lastly one 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 key thing that um, I've also briefly talked on but it's facilitating good faith partnerships um, between all the stakeholders so with these uh, ideas and 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 um, we can we can come together to ensure that our communities are strong and are safer, and our infrastructures for for community networks um, are more resilient in that aspect. All right, thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, so uh, we have uh, just seventeen minutes to the end of this session, but we have some key issues that would love to discuss before those 17 minutes get done uh, so uh, i'll just go back to caleb and um, i would love caleb to talk about critical infrastructure development plans yeah how can we ensure that countries actually develop these plans yeah thank you caleb okay thank you for the question uh first of all uh as a developing country I, I, I strongly believe that to ensure a developing country understand the framework and the plan for critical infrastructure system, uh, we must first know how to protect the critical infrastructure sector. Understanding the, the risks involved, protecting the critical infrastructure, knowing where its ability lies, <coughs> sorry, practice, practice uh, good cyber hygiene secure the internet of thing devices take advantage of the technologies establish emergency protocols also more vulnerable the more the vulnerability it is the more critical it becomes a lack of alternative increases its uh, criticalities also, uh, I think uh, collaboration between stakeholders like government, private sector, civil society, the, the private sector can help with some resources like routers, switches, computers, etc. While civil society, academia, and the technical committee can also collaborate to provide trainings to deploy the telecommunications infrastructure. Therefore, developing countries must also learn how to produce their own digital resources, physical components, and other devices that can help during critical during a, a, a disaster. They must be able to 
resource personnel that can understand emergency response just as like uh, Internet Society Ghana chapter collaborated with NetHope to train people in uh, disaster management I, I believe when we come together and provide resources for such people we will be able to manage uh, critical infrastructures developing countries must must uh, double uh, current investment level in critical project to have an effective plan I believe that when there is a lot of funding for people who wants to go into critical infrastructure, who wants to study critical infrastructure at the master's level, uh, it will also help because there will be a lot of people who would also come on board to help this uh, government organizations, the private sectors, and what have you, to be able to manage their critical infrastructure sectors. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Caleb. Uh, so, uh, Caleb has talked about uh, how we can ensure that countries actually develop these plans, which is very important. And it brings me to the next question or the next issue of uh, regulatory frameworks. And uh, Sha, if you could please uh, tell us what regulatory frameworks, uh, okay, in different regions. Uh, that you feel are, uh, are actually paramount or that are actually helping to govern the deployment of physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This includes uh, right. telecommunications infrastructure and the power grids that we yeah, just been talking I'm about. Over to you, Shah. Uh, thank you uh, for again asking the two questions. Actually, Whenever it comes to the regulatory frameworks, uh, by default, the governments uh, <laughs> come. Uh, you know that uh, every country is have a different, different uh, uh, like broadband policy or the service uh, providers uh, uh, rules. Uh, and regarding to that questions, I just want to mention, for example, that in ICT Act of Law, there is a uh, 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 options in case of that emergency service provider there are some sorts of uh, general guidelines that we need to uh, follow that in that uh, frameworks and also uh, whenever uh, some uh, institutions I earlier mentioned in tactical perspectives like uh, we need to be uh, some sorts of uh, because uh, day by day we are facing and we are uh, making the good practice so the best practice we formalize in a format work that may be the good approach of having the uh, structures that can come in the governance of the deployment uh, of equipments or the service one of the things that i uh, like to share here uh, like to ensure the technology uh, for the solutions fit for the purpose during that times and need to be flexible so uh, because it's an emergency period so uh, we cannot be so uh, strict to the uh, loss because uh, loss or that country's uh, um, uh, procedures but uh, have to be flexible to adaptation in response to the uh, emergency situations but uh, on the other hand you must be careful about the data uh, so that it can be aligned with that uh, uh, um, uh, at least minimum uh, recommendations uh, to that privacy protections uh, and the security of that uh, uh, particular uh, uh, affected uh, uh, humanitarian uh, areas. And also maybe during that project, uh, I think uh, the uh, most important is to having uh, emergencies help uh, from the regional office like uh, uh, to uh, 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 in this uh, uh, affiliated uh, works and obviously the governments and the uh, locals authorities engage with this so the best practice is to take their also suggestions and uh, uh, what are the nationals uh, uh, amendments or a need uh, that would be in our other uh, discussions so overall we need to think of uh, the best practice that i said uh, in perspective to the, uh, the not be harmful because we are using saying that uh, the national beat is also here involved the solar power system so in case of affected of the national grids the uh, temporary movement 
well uh, solar system that could also not be vulnerable for the uh, uh, disaster communities that is also need to be considered and also i think a um, uh, big aspect is also included that uh, uh, telecommunications what is that also uh, refer to that uh, uh, interconnectivity and that uh, interference of defense uh, operators or the uh, service provider uh, uh, that uh, need to be uh, figured out so that uh, it can give the best service because whenever the frequencies uh, or the service related to the telecommunication radio frequencies interact with that uh, uh, with one another it makes uh, the service uh, hampers and uh, that uh, is not the purpose to deliver our service so we should also be careful on these things these are the governing systems i think uh, from the technical perspective uh, could be in the consideration during the crisis moment thank you and so we get back to you all right thank you very much Shah, once again uh, so we have a question online uh, from Robert Nkambwe, uh, who is based in Uganda. Uh, and the question is, who should bear the cost of connectivity during a crisis? Yeah, A case in point is uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. ISPs provided uncapped uh, internet to educational institutions, but later they were made to Yet this was a global crisis. Uh, so I'm going to leave the other speakers think about that question. Uh, maybe Lynn, you could take up uh, that question. But uh, just uh, before you can answer that question, I would love to go to Anestina and uh, still on uh, the issue of policies. Um, how do we align with realities such as... Um, uh, of course the policy gaps how do we align with those realities in the implementation of connectivity over to you anestina very much in the sense so um in aligning to policy gaps in times of crisis during uh for interconnectivity during crisis i feel uh the following should be laid down to assist have um um a well-drafted guide as to what to do and not to be devastated in times of crisis so we need to have regulatory agencies and the government in various countries should ensure that there are compliant technical teams or regulatory agencies in every education organization and um, ethan mentioned frameworks yes so when there are laid down frameworks that will, would guide us in times of uh, crisis. These can be uh, under the regulatory agencies. The teams that are created in these agencies would make sure that whatever every community needs, the backups they need, what uh, terrestrial thing they have, and so what infrastructure they will need in times of crisis will be provided. It would also provide a reliable financial source for the agency. So in times of crisis, someone just asked the question about who bears the costs. So if uh, providing in providing reliable financial source for the agency, we can partner with NGOs, stakeholders, because I feel it's a collaborative effort. So stakeholders, NGOs, the government, the private sector, all coming together to probably have uh, funding for the agency that in times of critical issues, in times of crisis, we would not find ourselves wanting. For example, in Ghana, we have an agency called the NADMO, where in times of disasters, they get deployed out to help people who have been affected with food. Those who need places to sleep, get places to sleep. Those who need um, infrastructure like mattresses, those who need um, lights, are provided with lights, food, etc. So this can also help. And then establishing an independent board of directors and running the regulator with a clear legal mandate would ensure that in crucial times, they work independently and effectively, functioning on the policies that have been laid down in these regulatory agencies. Also, I'll talk about monopoly. We find out that um, we can have one multinational company running the technical aspects of so many telecom um, organizations a particular country and this does not help so the government must try and do away with uh, telecom monopoly 
so that it can bring about better communication services because if there's monopoly these companies are not going to be challenged enough to provide good services for their customers but then when there's the variety you feel challenged that if you're not doing the right things then your customers are going to be lost and they are going elsewhere and in times of crisis um the variety would also add up to help people because not one um gov no sorry no one organization is calling all the shots but then there are collaborating efforts from various organizations also there's the lack of um, interconnection among countries within um, regions in Africa and so like we all stated earlier we have to encourage community networks we've had some in Namibia Congo Ghana Kenya Tanzania South Africa etc and these are done by um, businesses some businesses and some organizations have partnered with NGOs and so the government has not been involved Involved yet, but then some businesses and some individual organizations have partnered with NGOs to get communities connected, and this has liberated them from isolation. So even if there hasn't been a crisis in a community yet, but then they've been isolated from um, the internet, they've been isolated in terms of connectivity. Some NGOs have been able to come up with community networks to support them, and so I feel continuing with this and improving upon it would also go a long way to help in times of crisis and disasters. And also, lastly, I'd like to um, say that we should improve on our digital literacy as citizens of countries. Improving on this digital literacy would also help develop our digital resilience in times of crisis. That is, you know how your infrastructures are working in your country and how to go around it so that if you are there and you are not getting help yet, you can actually have an idea of for yourself before help comes to you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Anestina. I think uh, Robert's question has uh, partially been answered. I mean, it's not about the government or the private sector, and it's not about civil society, but it's about everyone. When we have a crisis, when we have a disaster, and then um, uh, ensuring that there's emergency connectivity infrastructure is everyone's role. So. Um, I think uh, we have uh, two minutes and um, we've had a great discussion. Uh, I'm sure everyone has something to note or something to take home. It's now upon us as stakeholders to go back and ensure that our countries actually step forward to plan for um, uh, deployment of emergency infrastructure during times of crisis because this is a reality for us as humanity now. Yeah, we should expect this and we should plan for this. Uh, the gentleman there talked about how they're already planning to detect disasters just before they can happen. That should be uh, a plan for every country really. So that at the end of the day, we are not, well, we don't have scenarios where there's a disaster and there's totally no communication with the region or there's no coordination of um, humanitarian assistance. So uh, thank you very uh, thank you very much, uh, all speakers from uh, uh, from Caleb to to Anestina to Aileen to Shah to to Shadrach, yeah. Uh, so that has been our session. My name is Innocent Adrico, and uh, also not forgetting Ethan, he has been a key speaker for our session. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining, uh, both on site and uh, we've had uh, about 26 participants online. So thanks everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Yeah.